Well, good morning. good morning. Let's pray together first. Father, I thank you this day for the truth that we just sung about. The salvation, Lord, that I hate to admit, but it's true, Lord, that often the magnitude of that escapes me, Lord, and I forget. Lord, today, please, if anything comes out of this day, let us not forget what was actually done for us on Calvary, Lord, so that the life we choose to live is one that loves you, that loves others, that glorifies you in all that we do. I ask that you would be glorified in your church, in Jesus' name, amen? amen. If you have a Bible with you, turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 1, which is where we're going to spend a little bit of time here this morning. Anybody ever go to the doctor to have a physical? Okay. Anybody afraid to go to the doctor for a physical? Anybody know anybody who's afraid to go to the doctor for a physical? Why would that be? You don't want to hear the bad news. You don't want to, even if it's a true and accurate assessment of your health, you just don't want to know it. You'd rather ignore it and, and pretend that it's not true, right? Um, you know, my dad, who is a five-time cancer survivor, is a poster child in many ways for early intervention and going to the doctor and getting the checkups and all the tests that, that you know, you get, you know, because in finding out early on that you got something wrong with you, you're in a position to do something about it until, quote, unquote, it's too late. A friend of mine growing up had a mom who smoked for many years of her life, 40 years, um, quit smoking, and you know, a year and a half later was, died from lung cancer. And the reason is she was afraid to go to the doctor and probably didn't really quit till she realized she was so far sick and doing that. Now that, that to us is a, is a sad thing, correct? And I share that, that sounds sad. You know, and you go to the doctor and you know, what does the doctor do? He listens to your heart, make sure all the valves are working properly. They take your blood pressure. You, you know, the ideal being 120 over 80 or close to that, you know, your pulse rate, uh, you get blood tests, CBCs, make sure your red, white blood cells are good, you can get protein and enzyme tests these days to make sure all your other organs, you get checked for diabetes. And all of these things, we have these standards by which we're considered physically healthy, right? And we also have, according to those standards, we have ways to say, realize, hey, maybe I'm not healthy. Maybe my blood pressure's too high. Maybe, you know, my pulse isn't what it should be. Hey, my blood test is saying I'm anemic. Maybe I need to eat different things or do different things because I want to be healthy. Fair enough? Well, the scriptures give us the same point of view when it comes to our walk. And unfortunately, I think many times we are afraid, like many, to go to the doctor to have an examination to see if the standard by which determines that whether or not we're spiritually healthy is true of us. And, and the scriptures are very clear that we are to test ourselves, right? To see if we are in the faith, examine yourselves. So we're right in the first part of that verse, we're asked to test and examine ourselves. And I find many, very, time, very often in the church, we walk onto an ongoing assumption that we're doing fine and we're doing great, and maybe we're not. Maybe we need to be willing to examine ourselves. And it says, oh, do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? You know, the test and the examination of faith, we can think, well, yeah, I'm in the faith, I believe God exists, and I believe he's a reward of them who diligently seek him. I believe God gives me what I need, he answers my prayer, he heals people that are sick. But the examination of faith that the Apostle Paul through, through the Holy Spirit wants us to look at is that Jesus Christ is in us. Now, any, most Christians easily assume that Jesus Christ is in them. Of course, I, I, I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is in me. But what is it really saying to say Jesus Christ is in me? I mean, is that knowing about Jesus? Is that knowing some of the things that Jesus did for me? Is that knowing some of the things he wants me to do? Is that trying to live a nice life and not sin too much? Is that going to church on Sunday or a Bible study in the middle of the week? Are these the barometers that the scriptures give us 
to examine whether or not Christ Jesus is in us. And really, we're not talking about somebody we know about. The testimony for the Christian that Jesus is raised from the dead is that we know him through the power of the Holy Spirit. We know that Jesus is alive. You know, we sing a song, he walks with me and talks with me. It's a great song. But really, the examination of whether I'm in the faith is whether Christ Jesus is in me. And if Jesus Christ is in me, then my life will look and bear fruit that Christ Jesus is in me. If it's not, then an examination must take place. And for the church, I don't, I don't think we can afford to be afraid for the physical. I don't, I, can't, I don't think we can afford to be afraid of the physical. What I'm going to share with you this morning is something that's a culmination of many years of concern, and it was something that recently while I was in India was brought to me in such glaring and clarifying terms. And, and I'm going to bring you to a point where it hit me like a ton of bricks. And that was, um, I'm in India, I'm at the orphanage, and I'm on Facebook communicating, I can't remember whether it was my brother or my son Colin, because they do have power occasionally, you know, and you're hoping the power doesn't go off and it crashes and then you don't have to hit the, when the screen comes back up, stop windows normally uh, thing. Anybody who's ever had a computer go down knows what I'm talking about when you don't shut it down the right way. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm looking up, I'm looking at, you know, while you're I'm re going back and forth the message, I'm looking at the postings by, by the Church of Christ here. I'm looking at pursuit of things of the light, things of this age, worldly pleasures, fun, excitement, things, petty grievances, and I'm looking out at a family who has nothing, who spends each and every day of their lives trying to feed orphans, widows, and anybody who's poor, and not only feed them, but be concerned that the gospel is known to the idolatrous people around them. This isn't something they do once a week, and this isn't something they do twice a week. This is every day. Every day. They don't need hours watching TV to recover from the stresses of ministry. No, they do it with joy and pleasure. And see, to me, I'm like, well, that's the biblical standard, isn't it? That's what we read when Jesus founded the church in the book of Acts, a group of people who lived daily for the love and the glory of God. And the demonstration of their lives that Jesus Christ was alive from the dead, that God truly had brought salvation to men, was not just alone, in, it was the words and deeds of their life. And it was a demonstration of the power of God to transform people that are dead in selfish sins, vanity and pride, as we talked about, and make them new creations in Christ. And see, that's the beauty. It's the work of God. The new covenant is, in Jeremiah, that, that God's going to make a new covenant for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He's going to write his laws on their hearts and their minds. He's going to take out the old heart and going to give you a new heart. He's going to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he does this. And then he says... You do not have to, te have to teach each man his neighbor, know the Lord, for they all will know me. All who enter into a new covenant with, through Christ with God will know their God. That's the promise, not of me or anybody. That's the promise of scriptures. It's in Jeremiah, and it's quoted in the book of Hebrews. You know, and Ezekiel speaks about these same things. So it's really the work of God that's evidenced through what we call being born again, regenerated, new birth, new creation in Christ is, I'm not who I was. Even though I still have to wrestle against the old nature that's in me, there's a progression of repentance and ongoing sanctification in my life. I don't live for this age anymore. I live for the age to come. I don't live as a lover of pleasures anymore rather than a lover of God. I don't live with my thoughts on the things just at this age alone, but I live with eternity in mind, and what that eternity has, the verities, for my life and the life of everybody around me, in the church and those who are not of the church. That's what it means to know. And if we want to know what Christ Jesus in us looks like, is that our concerns are his concerns. Our burdens in our lives are his burdens. He's the head of the body. Anybody ever read the Bible? He's the head of the body, right? 
Well, the head hasn't changed his purpose. And if we are the body of Christ, we follow. I mean, the silly analogy is my head came to our service this morning. My foot didn't, you know, you know mutinize against me and decided it's going to stay home. If my foot is attached to my body by default, it what? It follows. And for us to say we're the body of Christ and say we don't follow Christ really is, is, is not true. You know, it's not possible. And for us to have our concerns about the things, let, and, and this is such, and I'm reading this section of scripture because, you know, for various things that I'm sharing in India, and really the Lord, you know, shared on my heart a burden for what life is back home here. And, and listen, listen to me. If I was in Iraq and I, or Syria right now and I was a pastor, I would have unique challenges to comfort a group of people that, whose families are going through unthinkable torture, right? But we are people in the church of the United States, and we have to be aware of the dangers that exist here and not belittle them and not keep, keep them as trite just because somebody is not holding death threats against us, per se. There are eternal dangers that I'm concerned about that we face here. Not because I think that that's true, but because I can't escape it from the testimony of Scripture, through the prophets, through the Lord himself, and even the Apostle Paul. There are warnings to the church, there are examinations that we must take. We must take and not take lightly. So I, I'm going to forewarn you, this is a sobering message. I'm going to leave you contemplating things at the end of this message, things that I encourage you from love I make no accusations to anybody today. But I, I, I have eyes to see what life is around me, the reputation of the Laodicean lukewarm American church and the world around us. That's our reputation. Lukewarm. Thinking that we're rich, wealthy, have all sorts of you know, goods and Bibles and everything else, but we don't know that we're poor, wretched, naked, and blind. That is the reputation. And it's also found amongst those many ministers you will talk to in this country. Have that burden. Have that burden. That is the reputation of the church. So let's look in Isaiah chapter 1. I'll forewarn you. These are probably challenging words, but I trust that they will hit home. In verse 2 of chapter 1, God begins through the prophet Isaiah, and he says, Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. That should grab our attention. God is saying, listen, all of creation, I got something to say. Do you think that God's saying what I'm about to say has extreme seriousness to it? He's calling all of creation to t stand at attention and hear. And what he says is, sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger but Israel does not know. My, peop my people do not understand. This is not speaking about those who don't know God or don't know about God. This is about God's own people. And he's saying, look, even an ox, a, a donkey knows his place of rest and who owns him. But my people don't know me. And this is, and I'll tell you what, this is God's lament. We, we, we are saved and reconciled to a God that wants us to know him. Not know about him. He's not the God of the song from a distance, you know. He's not the God that's far away. He's the God who's near and who delights to be amongst and dwelling in his people. Because the resting place in the temple of God is the people of God, not this building. When, the, when we're not here, this is nothing more than an empty structure. But when the people of God attend, then the presence of God is there. And we are the temple of the living God. Beautiful, isn't it? This is not this thing about God's concern to know him. I am so technology. Okay, good, I got it. Is nothing unique to this. It says, thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Oh, no, we would never do that. And let not the mighty man boast of his strength. Wouldn't do that. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this. If we can boast about something, that's right with God, let this be our boast, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercises what? Loving kindness, which is also translated sometimes mercy, 
justice. Remember these words now. Mercy, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For what? I delight in these things, declares the Lord. So we don't have to come up with, just here in a simple way, we don't have to begin to fathom what does God want from me. Even Micah says, what does you, oh man, the Lord has told you what he requires of you, to walk humbly before your God, to love justice and to love mercy. Same thing he says here. There's, now what does that look like though? Does that just look like that God loves mercy and justice and loving kindness towards me? No. On earth. And who is the temple of the living God? And who is the body of Christ? So how is he going to demonstrate that on the earth? Through us. But we can't do that in a self-centered life. We can't do that if we're burnt out consuming the pleasures and the cares of this life. We have no energy, and we're not willing to make the sacrifices that come with taking up our cross daily and following him. Jesus said daily. You know what that tells me? Daily. Daily, there's a call to me if I'm a follower of Christ to take up my cross and follow him, which means I have to deny myself things, and I have a choice. Do I do it joyfully because I've been saved from the wrath to come, and I can know my God and know my Lord, or will I be like the rich young ruler? When the, call, when the call comes to deny something to myself, I go away sorrowful. That really is the question you and I face every day because to serve the Lord and to follow him, he doesn't beat around the bush. It will require sacrifice. It will require me and you to deny ourselves. And when we do these wonderful things, the value and the reward is knowing him. We can no longer be sat, satisfied to be on the outside court and not know him and just know about him. God doesn't want people just to know about him. If you, know, if you just know about God, it's about as profitable to you and I as knowing about George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. They're dead. But I can know a God who's alive, and I can testify to the resurrection of Christ, not just because I read it in the Bible, but because I know him. Now, I come back from a land where most of the people are illiterate. They don't know, you can't tell them to read their Bible because they don't know how to read. But they know him. And I don't have to guess whether they know him and guess what? When you're surrounded by people and you don't have a clue as to what they're saying all the time, then fruit speaks to you very loudly. They don't have to tell, they don't know the Bible like we do, but they know the Lord. And the danger is us thinking because we know a lot of doctrine, we know God. And I'm telling you, that's not true. Fruit will demonstrate that that's not true. Because this book is a sharp two-edged sword in the hands of a person filled with the Spirit of God. It does cut, but it heals. And in the hands of somebody who doesn't know him, it butchers and destroys. And the casualty is a group of people who don't know the Lord because their testimony is what they've seen of those who profess to be followers of Christ are nothing like the Christ of the scriptures. Gandhi, I love your Christ. I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. What a horrible indicting statement from a man who actually followed Jesus despite considering himself a Hindu. Now we can't wrap our brains around it, but he looked to Jesus to live a life in many ways that he chose to live. All right. Shut up, Charlie. Let's, uh... Verse 4, a last sinful nation to people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, son who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from him. And then he goes on because what happened to them was there were things and, things and judgments that God was bringing upon them to kind of get them to wake up about where they were. And it says in verse 9, I'm just going to do this for the sake of time. You can go back and read this entire chapter. It says, unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom, we would be like Gomorrah. Never, ever something you want to be compared to or referenced as in Scripture. Because Sodom and Gomorrah is used and referenced throughout Scripture as a indication and an example of the judgment God annihilated and destroyed, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It didn't leave a trace of them. 
So now he's saying to his people, now he's saying, unless it was a few people, we would have been just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, not only that, let's see what he says to him next. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Now he's calling his own people Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies or meetings. Okay? I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. Now that's puzzling because everything he just referenced that was grieving him were the things that they were supposed to do. They were things that the people of the Lord did. But he's saying it grieves them and he's calling them Sodom and he's calling them Gomorrah. Well, what is the sin of Sodom? This was the guilt of your sister Sodom and it's not what immediately comes to your mind. What comes to your mind is she and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease. But she did not help the poor and the needy. Anybody who has a simple uh, elementary school education can, should be alarmed at how very accurately that describes most of how life is lived around us. That should alarm you, that there's a danger, that this is the pattern of life in the land that you and I live in. This should alarm us. This should tell us that there's a danger. Now, wait a minute. You're like, Charlie, God doesn't want us to have... That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we need to examine... This isn't for... And listen, let's not be unwise and compare ourselves by ourselves. Stop. If you're automatically thinking of somebody else in this room that, beside you, that this actually appear, um, applies to more than you. Because this is for all of us to examine, myself included. I don't put myself above examining myself in this. This tells me there's a danger. There is a danger. We have been given so much. But we're, if we really count ourselves as stewards and not possessors, we'll understand that what we have given is for us to manage for God, for his purposes, and not just to hoard up into ourselves. Riches in the scriptures are dangerous. There's no getting around that. And it's like fire. Fire is dangerous, isn't it? But fire is intended to be a medium to serve. It gives me warmth in the cold winter like last year. It gives us light. We cook our food with it. But if we don't handle it properly, it can destroy our lives. And with the warnings that come to us in Scripture of having an abundance and careless ease and arrogance, and even God warned his people, Israel, when he took them out of Egypt and gave them all these things, take heed that you don't forget me. Beware that when you're comfortable and everything's going good, that you do not forget me. You do not forget me. This is a warning. So let's keep reading. So he goes, I hate you, verse 14, I hate your new moon festivals, your appointed feasts, they become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them, so when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. This kind of mindset they had actually caused unanswered prayers. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Now, let's think about this. They are going to church. They are going to prayer meetings. They're doing the things that religion demands of us. And God is upset with them. So the measurement of the health of the Christian cannot just be that I go to church, I have a prayer time, and that I... Uh, and that I go to a, a weekly Bible study or something. That can't just be the measurement alone. Because people are doing these things, and God is upset, but he's calling them Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says that, he says that their hands are covered with blood. Now, I don't know what comes to your mind. Does this mean that there were a bunch of axe-murdering maniacs running around the streets? No, when the scripture says that blood is on your hands, it means that you're guilty by omission from your inactivity to, to go about and take care of the things that are before you. Paul told the Ephesian elders when he left them, I tell you this day that I am pure of the blood of all men. Why? Because I didn't hold back anything from you that was profitable for you. 
Blood guiltiness in scripture doesn't always mean that you're murdering people. It means by your inactivity, knowing what you know, and your inactivity to do something, you are guilty of the blood of people when you, you see and you refuse to get involved. That's what it is. So let's see what God speaks to them about rectifying the situation, and let's see what repentance about what the God who says what? I love love and kindness, I love mercy, I love justice, right? I delight in these things, right? That's what God says. So let's see what God's antidote for them is. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Well, thank God we have the blood of Christ to do that. Amen? Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Remove the evil. We have to make decisions. We have to remove the things in our life that are evil. We just can't allow them to continue. Learn to do good. Seek justice. There's the word again, right? Reprove the ruthless, which means we have to warn people. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now, God says. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know, and again, go down to verse 23. Your rulers are rebels, companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe. You've been, if you lived in Rhode Island your whole life, you know that's true. And chase after rewards. They do not defend the orphan, nor does the widow plea, widow's plea come before him. This is what God says it matters to him. It's not arbitrary. It's not vague. It's not selective. And he repeats it over and over again. We've been entrusted with goods. We've been entrusted with the greatest treasure of all time, those that are saved, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our pleasures... And our pursuit of pleasures cannot be the primary directive of our lives. Preserving our little lives and keeping them safe for Christians cannot be that. It's not a different standard of judgment for America than it is in any other land on this nation. It's not like you've got to live in a, you know, I refuse to believe we all got to live in a hard place in order to be real Christians. Do you? I refuse to believe that that's got to be true. We've been given so much so that we can be a blessing to so many, whether it's materials, money, and resources. That is what we're called to be. We are called to be the hands and feet of the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and deed. But if we see somebody, you know, and you say, well, you know, and then the Good Samaritan parable comes to mind, right? You know, the guy's lying on the road, wounded and, you know, bleeding, and, and everybody thinks automatically, literally, well, of course. If somebody was lying on the I, of course I would help. But it's not about the actual deed, because anybody, any decent human being, Christian or not, is going to stop and call 911 and get help for somebody lying on the side of the road. So he's not saying that literally. What he's saying is, when God lays before you somebody, and the question, the, the parable was a response to a man who wanted to selectively choose who he was going to be neighbor to. We don't get to selectively choose. We're followers, not leaders. We don't tell Christ who we're going to minister to. Just because we don't like it doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility. Just because we don't like them, just because we'd rather help here than there, doesn't, that's not our choice if we're followers, if we're servants. That's not our choice. It really isn't. I'm going to show you this biblically in a minute, why that really isn't our choice. But the man was trying to justify himself by who he wanted to be neighbor to. And I'm telling you, the church has got a responsibility to those near and far. Near and far. And it really is, who does the Lord lay at your gate? Does it, go to Luke 16 with me. Anybody have a physical? And any woman ever have a mammogram? Is that a, is that a comfortable uh, procedure? Any of the men ever go to the doctor and see the rubber glove go on? Is that a comfortable procedure? But it's necessary, isn't it? It's necessary, isn't it? I'm only saying that because I firmly understand today, and even as I'm looking at these, that there's a degree of discomfort we're going to face in examining ourselves in light of these things. I know that. 
but I'd ra wouldn't you rather, and wouldn't I rather, and don't I have a responsibility and love to you if I've been burdened by these things and see these things clearly from Scripture to at least afford you the opportunity to consider it? How would I be clean of the blood of all men if I know this to be true biblically and not say it to anybody? Right? I would be, and you'd have every right to look at me and say, you knew this and you didn't tell me? Wouldn't you? What I say, Luke 16? There are many things in this parable. There are many different thoughts in this parable. I don't want to focus on teaching the whole parable today, but there's a point here. Luke 16, verse 19 says, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores. And longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table, besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. So here's the picture. You've got a guy who's got everything he could possibly need, feasting and having a good old time every day, and you've got a guy who's in desperate need laid at his gate. Did, is there any indication from Jesus that the rich man got the choice of the man being laid at his gate? But he was laid there. And he was laid there, and obviously... If he's laid at his gate and the man goes in and out of his house, it's fair to say he sees it, right? He can't claim, I didn't know he was there. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are being in agony. Now, I'm going to end there, because there's a lot more that goes on. But the point that I'm saying to you, the real point I want to get to from this is, God's laying people at our gate. But if we don't have the mindset to see, we won't see it. If we have the heart of God, if we know our God and we know our Lord, then we will see that it's not just that it happens to be laid on again. And if it's not, and I want to do the things that delight God, then I have to do some pursuing of it, don't you think? Because it's not like, you know, if I don't see it in my everyday life, and it's there if I have eyes to see, then shouldn't I pursue the things that glorify God? Shouldn't it be my delight if, I, if Christ Jesus is in me and I'm about his purposes to be about these things? Shouldn't it be? But when the church is not about these things, then it gives a hypocritical witness to the unbelieving world around it. It gives a powerless witness to the world around it. The reputation, unfortunately, many times of the average Christian in America is a hypocritical, critical, judgmental, unloving, unkind, I have more friends in a bar than I do in a church, kind of reputation. Now, I know that, listen, that's a blanket statement. That doesn't apply. To, I'm not applying that to everybody. But the fact that that's there should mean, I want to do something about the reputation of my Lord. That's all I'm saying to you. I'm not saying that blanketly applies to every Christian, but I want to do something to show people that my Lord is raised from the dead, that he is about justice, that he is about mercy, and he is about saving you. That's, what the, that's the test of Christ Jesus is in me. There's so many warnings of getting strangled and choked by the cares and pleasures of this life. We need to take them seriously. Jesus is just not throwing words out there for us to think and pick and choose whether we want to apply them. If he is Lord, Lord, then let's do what he says and not be the ones who stand before him and say, Lord, Lord, and not do the things that he says. Right? Right? And again, it's something that, that, that we're called to do and it should be our joy to do and our pleasure. I mean, come on. Knowing the creator of the heavens and the earth, is there a greater high, a greater rush, a greater pleasure than knowing him? To be used by the Lord Jesus Christ as his hands and feet to minister mercy and grace and tangible food and spiritual food and the water of life and the water to drink for the body. Isn't that really what we should be about? God is not, you know, God is not deceiving us about these things. He's not hiding these things. He warns them about this, and then he says, he pled the cause of the afflicted and the needy. Then it was well. Is not that what it means to know me, declares the Lord? It's not a blurry thing. It's not a vague thing. 
I want to know the Lord. I want to be a man who knows the Lord. The question for me in this examination is, do, what do we do this? Do we just run out and start doing this to do works? That's not necessarily true, but maybe you should. It really is an examination of my heart. And it really is, Lord, I need to know you. I repent. My examination, Lord, come, makes me come up and I'm short. My blood pressure is high, Lord. I want it to be right. My blood count is off, Lord. My heart valves, my heart valves are not working right, Lord. Can you do some open heart surgery on me and give me that heart that you promised to give me? He's not going to hold back on that. And then the joy is knowing him. Knowing him and being the church of Jesus Christ. And, and, and you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to inspire this. And putting to death the Laodicean reputation, if nowhere else on this country, let it be true of us here. Amen. And let us inspire other brothers and sisters who are in other folds and other congregations along the same lines. Let us be people that do that, that inspire. Isn't that the assembling of, the selves, uh, of ourselves according to Hebrews? That we provoke one another to love and good works. This life is short. There was a funeral here this week. Even though the man that we buried was married over 50 years, that's short. You ask his family, they now really realize how short life is. I'm 50. I've wasted too many of my 50 years for myself. I don't know how many years of vibrancy I have left. And if you guys that are young don't think you have all the time in, in, in the life to be, get around to being serious too. Yes, pursue marriages, pursue schooling, pursue careers, but not at the expense of what we're talking about today. Will we make, is the treasure, the pearl of great price, the kingdom of God, and knowing the king worth selling all that we have to have it? Is the value estimated appropriately? That's what Jesus asked. You know, many times you hear the parable of the rich young man who was told to sell all he had, and most people's response would be, well, he didn't say that to everybody. And that's true. And I'm not saying that is for everybody but everybody should be willing to say, yes, Lord, I will. Whether you're ever called on the carpet to do it or not. Everybody who's a follower of Christ should not hear that question and go away southward. I'm not saying that applies to everybody. I'm not here even to tell you, leave here today and go sell everything you have. But you have to have a heart that says, I will do that if he asks me to do it. And if you don't, then maybe what we have is more valuable to us than knowing him. Isn't that true? You know, so to go to church and not be about the things that matter to God isn't going to help us. But come to church. Be encouraged with the fellowship of the saints. Let's praise the Lord together. Go to the weekly fellowships and be encouraged in your faith. But live a life that honors him. Be about the justice and the love. Be about the poor that need. If my life is filled with what next pleasurable activity I have and I'm burning myself out to fund it, I better look at that. Because I may very well be guilty of being a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God. And I don't say this to beat anybody up, but you know what? I can't escape these concerns from the scriptures, from Jesus himself, from his apostle Paul. Paul said about the Philippian church, I'm telling you weeping. He's crying that many walk, live their lives as enemies of the cross of Christ, whose God is their belly or their appetites, who set their minds on earthly things and not things that are above. That is what Paul saying his burden and his weeping is about the church. So the Paul, it's so serious, he's actually crying about it. Right? Philippians chapter 3, if you want a reference on that. So this is what we get to be. Years I spent in vanity and pride, let it not be no more. Knowing not, my Lord was crucified. Caring not, for me he died on Calvary. But mercy was great and grace was, was free. And pardon was multiplied to me. There my soul found liberty at Calvary. That's why Galatians says, for free, it was for freedom that Christ set you free, and do not 
use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but by love serve one another. If we walk in the spirit, which is really what we've been talking about, the new creation in Christ, having Christ in us, having the heart of God, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We waste so much time trying not to fill the, fulfill the lust of the flesh, trying not to sin too much, trying not to indulge in sexual immorality and lust and greed and you know, evil thoughts and angers and bitterness. Why don't we just be about the work of the Lord? Because when you walk in the spirit, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're about the things of God. We will not be struggling against sin the way we will. We won't be depressed because we don't have the things in our life that we think we should have. That's covetousness when you get right down to it. When, you're, when you think you need something in your life that you don't have, that's really the foundation of covetousness and it's selfishness and it's idolatry, according to the Apostle Paul. So let's be the people of God. Let those who name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Let's know the dangers that exist around you and I, and let's be the people of God. Amen to that? Doesn't, isn't it worthy? Isn't it right? Listen, I'm not telling you we're saved by doing these things. I'm saying that these are the things that saved people do. You'll know a tree by its fruit. Jesus wasn't, you know, if the core of the, if, if the, core of the tree is good and healthy and produces apples, you don't have to tell it, go produce, you know, you don't go to a pear tree and say, produce apples. It will produce apples. So really, it's like this is the fruit of a people that knows their God. Daniel says, they that know their God will do exploits. They will be strong and do exploits. Let's have the heart of God. Let's examine ourselves. Let's know the dangers that exist in the land of you and I around us. If we were in a different country facing different challenges than as the church of Jesus Christ there, we would have to be honest about the challenges we face there, right? These are the challenges that you and I face here. And every day we face these things. Every day, my Lord expects that he's going to put something before me that requires me to pick up my cross and deny myself and follow him. In small and in great matters, you know? I don't know. I'm not your Lord. I'm not here to define that for you. But I have to be aware and see it for my own life. And let's not stand, listen, let's not stand before the judgment seat of Christ with any regrets. Well, you know, no regrets. They're real, you know, I say this as a man who, who, who learned this in one of the weakest times of my life. My time in India was really an exposure to me of how weak I was. You know, I went through internal challenges that really showed me, you know, at times that, gosh, I, I need your help. You know, his grace is enough is a great song, but it's a lesson only learned in places that he will take us that we don't want to go. That's what Paul tells us. He says that when he was asking God to remove the thorn in his flesh and then went on to say some of the craziest statements a human being will ever say and that I delight in distresses, infirmities, and all these calamities. But when I am weak, then I am strong. If I continue to play it safe and rely on my own strength and my own wisdom, then really what I'm depriving myself of is knowing my Lord. Because if the apostles never dropped their nets and followed him, they would never have known him. Right? We, we, you know, when he, we hear pe- the question is, when we hear somebody say that I know the Lord Jesus Christ and I know my God, is that a f- really, is that something we just quickly say, yes, I do? But in reality, it seems like a distant reality to us. Let it not be a distant reality to us. He's not hiding from us, is he? He wants us to know him, doesn't he? He wants us to know him. What else we, uh, well, I don't know if I'm going to, yeah, well, here you go. Another painful exam. Deliver those who are being taken away to death and those who are staggering to the slaughter. Oh, hold them back. If you say, see, we did not know this, does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? And does he not know it who keeps your soul? And will he not render to man according to his work? Anybody who's saved understands the implications. If you're saved. If you've been saved, you understand you're saved from the wrath of God. You're saved from the bondage of sin for a lifetime. So anybody who's saved can't say, I don't know the implications of salvation. We can't make that statement. We have to, and I'll tell you what, if we devalue that understanding of what we've been saved from, then we will 
take the things of God lightly in our lives, right? If you were saved from drowning, you would have a very, and somebody saved you, and you were like gasping for air, and you thought, I've, I've saved somebody who was drowning. I mean, the panic, the fear, the terror, most of those people never went back in the water again because they had a fair and healthy estimation of how close they came to dying. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm saying. Let us understand the greatness of our salvation. And the mercy and grace is only understood in the severity of what we were facing had Jesus not died from us. God doesn't owe us anything. The wages of sin or death actually does owe us something. Death. Wages are something you're owed, right? Anybody work a full week and then you go to get your paycheck? You're owed that money because you worked. So what the scriptures say is the wages of sin or death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord and what he did on our behalf. We can never forget that because that's the foundation stone right now of everything that I'm sharing with you today. That we're a people that God chose to love and save by grace and empower us by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to live the very life that we're talking about doing today. We can't do this in our own strength. So really the response today is for me and all of us, surrender. I need thee. Every hour of the day, I need thee. I need your strength, Lord. I'm so prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We have to hate sin. We have to hate our selfishness and then run for the refuge of the grace and mercy that's found in Christ Jesus and be washed with the love and the forgiveness that he gives. And in turn, be vessels that that love and mercy and grace and love and kindness can flow out to, to the world. God's always wanted that. Even Egypt, I mean, even Israel, when he took them out of Egypt, he wanted them to show the nations how merciful and great he was. He told them, don't glean your fields because there are people that I want to feed. So leave the edges of your fields so that those who don't have can come and be fed. Don't take everything for yourself. Don't live for yourself. I'll take care of you. Seek first the kingdom of God. And all the things that you're going to worry about and all the things you're going to do in your own strength and power, you're not. I will add it to you. I take care of birds. I take care of flowers. That's what he says. And we will never know that unless, unless it's put to the test. Right? But we have to seek first the king and his kingdom. Now, with a view for the eternal promise of God that there's a day coming when all the tears are wiped away and all the pain is gone and all the sorrow is gone and all the death is gone and even the barriers that I have according to my flesh now will be removed and I will see God in all his glory and the only response I will have is his mercy like we heard last week hallelujah his mercy endures forever where we sing and praise him all the days of our life so I'd like to, you know, I'm tempted to say sorry for the serious word today, but I'm not. I'm not. No, you, you know why? Because, uh, you know, it, it's, it, again, anybody who's gone for a physical test knows sometimes you come away from certain tests and you're, you're a little uncomfortable. And, and, the, and the blessing of examining ourselves is, is that we're encouraged to do it. And let's not be afraid of the doctor and let's not be afraid of the exam. Let the exam have its work. <coughs> My father's alive after five bouts of cancer because he was willing to endure the testing and the examination. A man I never thought would be alive at this point. But, you know, let's be, let the Holy Spirit and the Word of God do the examination. I mean, time hinders me from going any further with you right now because there's so many other records in Scripture we can go to. It's just time that hinders me. You search the scriptures. You examine them to see if the things I'm saying to you are true. Don't be afraid to go to the doctor. Don't be afraid to go for the physical exam. Don't be like my friend's mother who didn't want to go to the doctor and just thought I'll finally quit, but then, you know, it was too late at that point to really have, let it have an effectual change in her life, you know? Let us examine ourselves and let us go to the one who's for us and not against us who says these things because he loves us, you know what I'm saying, and desires for us to know him. The blessings and the rewards are eternal, right? Let's, let's be as passionate in the eternal 401k, the treasure in heaven. Let's be more passionate for that than we would be for the temporal. 
Let's be passionate for that. Let's be passionate for the things that God is passionate about so that he gets the glory he is due, so that the saved get lost, so that he gets to be the hands and feet to care for the poor, the hungry, the needy, the orphan, the widow, which he clearly demonstrates he's concerned about. We don't get to be selective and choose who our neighbor is. We don't get to be selective and choose who he's going to lay at our gate. We just respond when he does. Oh, I don't like that one. I want to go help somebody here. I don't want to do that. I want to go do my own thing. Really? That's really not the heart. That's not the fruit that will demonstrate that Christ Jesus is in you and, and keeps you from failing the test. Feeling test is, is, Lord, you've laid the need before me. And the problem, and, and, the, and really, inevitably, we can't get around the fact in order to be the minister, ministering hands of the body of Christ, we have to deny ourselves to do something about it. But the pleasure, you know what I'm saying? But the pleasure of that and the joy of that is, is, is knowing him and being co-laborers with the eternal creator. Amen? Amen? So, Lord, I will say this much. I and we all need your grace this day. And thank you that you are plentiful and gracious and liberal and abounding in grace, God. You, you delight and you dwell with the man or the woman who's of a contrite and broken heart the man or woman who trembles at your word, that you may come alongside in comfort and that you may lift up. Lord, help us to humble ourselves before your mighty hand, that you may exalt us in your due time, Lord, that you may display us as trophies of your grace, as bearers and vessels of a people that can proclaim how great is our God, the things that we sing about. Lord, I ask for forgiveness for myself, and here, all who join in me this day, for the often opportunities you lay before my gate. And I'm more concerned about my things, God, than your things. The too often opportunities you lay before me, Lord, and I, I'm even more concerned about my religious duties than the heart of a man and woman you lay before me, Lord. So, Lord, I ask that you would receive glory this day. Bring revival to your people Bring revival in this land, Lord. Please, in your mercy, help the reputation of your church here for the sake of those, for your glory, for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and for the sake of those that are lost and perishing in need, Lord. I ask that you would revive us and, call, and, and create in us again, renew us again, revive us again, Lord, to be the new creations in Christ that you desire us to be. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.